how do you make this kind of mindset shift to focus on revenue while keeping a finger on the pulse of the leading indicators across the business? Browse through LinkedIn, you'll find the occasional bash of MQLs, which I think it's completely wrong because it is a leading indicator. So what you need to do after collecting the MQL is that you cynically need to study the quality of the MQLs that come through. Do they look like people you normally sell to? Funny narrative you can use is just think about every single lead that comes through as a physical person that you have to walk into the sales room and present this person. Like, okay, this is this person. He or she is aged this. She does this. She wants to hear about our product. Would you want to do that presentation in front of the sales team or not? You find yourself as the leader of your RevOps team, burdened by the lack of understanding of the customer journey and the inability to utilize data analysis effectively for marketing and sales decisions. It's like sailing without a map, making choices based on instinct rather than data-driven insights. You're aware that data analysis holds the key to unlocking the secrets of customer behavior, but you're drowning in an overwhelming sea of information. Every day, you witness missed opportunities and inefficiencies in your strategies, and it's painful to see valuable leads slipping away and resources going to waste. Nobody wants this. But what are the exact steps to counteract this lack of understanding? Stefan Hedebrandt shares it all with us in this episode of The Run Revenue Show. Stefan is the Chief Marketing Officer and co-founder of Dream Data, a platform that automatically extracts cleans, and simplifies your B2B go-to-market data to provide complete transparency on what's driving your revenue. In this episode, Stefan discusses the importance of utilizing review websites and software platforms, why you need to understand the customer journey and optimize marketing efforts, the significance of focusing on quality over quantity in lead generation, and more. Listen to our through the full episode to hear exactly how Stefan mastered these crafts to ultimately boost Dream Data's revenue through the ceiling. I'm Kyle Coleman, sales pro turned SVP of marketing at Clary. Run Revenue is the show where revenue pros learn to stop revenue leak, achieve revenue precision, and grow their companies and careers. This is the Run Revenue Show with Kyle Coleman. Hello, everybody, and welcome to this episode of the Run Revenue Podcast. I'm very excited today to be joined by a fellow marketer. I don't know if we've done this before on this show. Stefan Hedebrandt, CMO at Dream Data. How are you doing today? Thank you, Kyle. I'm, I'm super excited to be here. And uh, yeah, it's true. I'm a, I'm a CMO now. As you know, I, I tried the stint of uh, CRO for a short while, but uh, got a lot of respect for sales. But I learned also that it's a craft that it's not my core interest. It's hard to get good enough at it for myself. So I, I s- typically stick within the, the marketing growth kind of hemisphere. Yeah, much respect to the sellers out there. They have the hardest job going right now. So we're going to get into your bio in a moment. I just want to frame up the episode for the listeners. We're going to be talking a lot about driving alignment between sales and marketing. We're going to talk about a modern customer journey and make sure that you, the listeners have a really good understanding of how do buyers actually buy today. And you've got some pretty surprising insights on that front. And then we're going to get down to maybe more of the tactical level and talk about, okay, considering what we know about the buying journey, what do you need to do differently as a marketing team, as a sales team to capitalize on these trends? So plenty of juice coming. Let's start. Stefan, walk us through your career. Where have you been? What have you seen? And what do you do now? Yeah. So like back when it all started, I, I finished the, the Copenhagen Business School like 14 years ago now. Ever since I've been working in, in B2B companies, digital B2B companies, uh, SaaS, B2B SaaS companies, all of them extremely digitally focused. So my view of the world <laughs> is very much uh, affected by this. It's also been rather like SMB size companies. So... Mm-hmm. There might be some of the things that I, I say here that makes a lot of sense in your, if you're an SMB, but if you're an enterprise, it may not be as simple <laughs> as it is in SMB. But so kind of, it's very a very digital B2B background and a, a kind of SMB startup kind of uh, background that I have. And then I've covered all sorts of marketing growth related roles in the past I don't know, eight years or so. I've been a, a marketing leader. Beautiful. And we're going to talk about you making this move that I don't know if I've heard of anybody else making before, where you were the chief revenue officer at Dream Data, and now you are the chief marketing 
officer at Dream Data. So let's let's segue into our first topic here. Talk to us about sales and marketing alignment. Like, give us the headline. How do you actually make this happen? I think one thing I'll maybe tee up and say that I've heard you talk about before, and certainly I've seen Dream Data post a lot about is you need to be marketers, marketing, need to be measured on the North Star metric of the business, which is not leads created, not meeting set. It is revenue. Talk to us about that. Easier said than done. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that this is the, the fundamental thing we need to understand when we're doing B2B marketing. There's no other way than the scorecard being when the sales team sells something, then that's when you've done your job well. And that entails a lot of different things. It entails that you don't focus on kind of siloed metric about how many leads can we collect per month, but you should be more focused on, you know, how many sales opportunities did you source for the business this month or this year, et cetera. So you shift your attention from like just hitting your own sub metrics to making sure you do everything you can for the business to hit its sales metrics. That's the easy pitch of it. The, the harder thing is how, how do you actually do this? I think there's some of the things that we do and we found that work quite well for us. The one thing is that the marketing team always has somebody present at the weekly pipeline meetings. And I think that that's, it's crucial that somebody from marketing sits in there and hear what is it that the sales team is facing out there on the battlefield every day. Who are we in competition with right now? What questions are they getting asked consistently? Where are the value proposition strong? Where is it weak? And so forth. And what marketers are really good at is doing the, the one-to-many exercise. So if they can kind of utilize the one-to-one -one information that the sales team picks up from prospects and then turn into really nice one-to-many answers through different sorts of content, that's where the marketing team can really, really uh, assist the sales team. I love that concept, Seth, and I don't know if I've heard about somebody talking about it that crisply. So making sure that marketing people are embedded in internal sales calls and taking the one-to-one -one insight and turning it into a one-to-many campaign. I absolutely love that. On this point about aligning around revenue, you mentioned, you use this phrase that it's not about, quote, how many leads we can collect. I think that's a really interesting way of thinking about it because that's what a lot of marketing teams do. It's like a kid collecting baseball cards. It's not about how many cards you have in the portfolio. It's about, is there actually any value in these cards that we've collected? So easier said than done again, but talk us through, like, how do you make this kind of mindset shift to focus on revenue while keeping, you know, a finger on the pulse of the leading indicators across the business? And that's very true as well, Kyle. And I think there, there's also, if like browse through LinkedIn, you'll find the occasional bash of MQLs, which yeah. I think it's completely wrong because it is a leading indicator. So the time between you doing something and that number uh, going up or down is quite short. So you get kind of, you get a good feedback loop there. But what you need to do after collecting the MQL is that you like, you cynically need to study the quality of the MQLs that come through. Do they look like people you normally sell to? Or is it like mom and pop shops coming through right. that it's never ever gonna be uh, something that who you're gonna sell to? My journey with co-founding Dream that I did, I think I did the first 100 demo calls myself. You can find the worst language, but like, I don't want to sit in a one hour call because that person is never going to buy <laughs> right. our product. Like that could be another trick, just making sure that the marketer does a demo call once a month or something like that. Because you get so much respect for not wasting salespeople's time. If you've tried going through these horribly qualified uh, demo calls, and I think that's where the MQL goes wrong. It is actually an acronym for marketing qualified leads. So don't ship anything over to the sales team that doesn't have a big Q in the qualified. So like, I think the funny narrative you can use is just think about every single lead that comes through as a physical person mm. that you have to walk into the sales room and present this person. Like, okay. This is this person, he or she is his age, this, she does this, she wants to hear about our product. Would you want to do that presentation in front of the sales team or not? So I think there's many ways that you can get respect for sales, but like working next to them, trying to walk their shoes gives you a lot of respect uh, for what you need to do as marketers. You don't need to just attract volume. You need to attract quality first. That is really well said. And I love that mental exercise of, would I be proud if I had to introduce in the real world this lead to this seller and 
how many marketers can really look at themselves in the mirror and say, yes, I'm confident that our MQL and our lead scoring process is providing that kind of filtration system. Probably the minority of people can say with confidence that that's happening. A key part of this, Stefan, and something I know that you and Dream Data take very seriously, and by the way, you and, and Dream Data published a, a top 10 list of things you have to do to drive alignment between sales and marketing. Go check that out on dreamdata.io. One of the recommendations there is you have to have a really tight definition of the ideal customer profile. And that tracks to exactly what you just said. Are we actually creating leads that we can sell to? So talk to us about the ICP, the ideal customer profile, and the importance of defining that, co-defining that between sales and marketing. Yeah, I think that that has really been an inflection point in, in the growth with, as we've seen at Dream Data when was when we finally got ourselves together and actually did this exercise because it is rather painful that you decide, okay, there's actually people in this world that we will try not to sell this product to, <laughs> even though they knock our door. You know, there's always going to be practical periods where you need to hit a target, but overall being really deliberate about who you sell to can really, really make a big difference across your whole company. At Dream that we regard the ideal customer profile kind of as a North Star for all the teams, not just sales and marketing. So who are we building this product for uh, that in entails kind of which integrations matter, which integrations doesn't, who should be the happy users, who should see us try to really please. And then, you know, in marketing, who are we trying to attract and which leads should actually then be assigned to salespeople for them to go chase it or not. And, you know, it's quite simple at the end, kind of your company can only use its money once. And if you're not working kind of towards the same direction, then you're going to get ineffective growth. And I, I think my best advice here would be to start with the easier exercise of creating an antithesis of who are we selling mm. to? Mm -hmm. Because it can be very hard to kind of say, it's exactly these people, but it's easier for you to say, okay, it's not these guys, it's not these guys, it's not these guys. And little by little, you train your team in spotting who's mostly, most likely to extract a lot of value out of our product and hence going to sign a big contract, but also renew that contract once it's up. It's really well said. And I think the ICP has two different main levers that you need to pull. One is the firmographic understanding of the ideal customer profile. What industry are they in? What size are they? Are they venture backed or whatever it may be? The firmographic side of things you really can codify. The second side is the personas that you sell to. Within those accounts, who are the green, yellow, red persona profiles that we either should be targeting or we should be avoiding? Because not everybody is going to be the right fit. And if you don't do those two things in tandem, you're going to end up, I don't know if this is a phrase in Denmark, but you're going to end up with a lot of tire kickers, people that go to the car lot to buy a new car, and they just want to look around, look at the features, kick the tires and move out. And that's what you'll get a lot of times. And we went through this exact exercise, Stefan at Clary, where when I started four and a half years ago, literally in my first month, I was like, we need to memorialize an ICP. We're all over the place. We've got sellers trying to sell to United Airlines and we've got sellers trying to sell to SMB tech companies. Like that is a huge gap for a small company. And what ended up happening is we narrowed the focus. We maintained the pipeline creation that we we're able to do. And we doubled our win rates, doubled our win rates. And that, you talk about an inflection point, that, that certainly happened for us at Clary. It's so interesting how much it matters. And I think it's because like buyers, you know, it's not because they're lacking information out there on the internet. <laughs> You're getting stuff down your throat with information and content every day. So for your content to be or like communication really to hit the bullseye, you really need to be speaking to a specific person. Otherwise, you know, if it's just like, semi-generalistic, you'll just browse through and go to another company because the company you're researching is not really expressing that they understand the pains that you sit in every single day. That's really well said. And a perfect segue to our next topic, which is these insights that you found by studying the customer journey, the benchmarks that you were able to uncover across different industries. I know we could break it down into SaaS. We could look at non-tech industries, things like that. You can go whatever direction you want, but Give us some headlines for what you found. What does a modern customer buying journey really look like? Yeah, happy to, Kyle. I can just like the data that we studied here are, I think it was somewhere like 414 of our customers. And what Dream that it does is we basically track uh, the complete customer journey from the least intent until the closed one deals. So we know a whole lot about our customers' customer journeys. 
Uh, and that's what we made these benchmark out of. I'll just drop a few of them and then we can like, drill into them. I think the first one is that we saw the average journey would be 192 days from the first touch until the count was won. There was 31 sessions involved in every deal. There was more than two people involved uh, in every deal that was closed. Say for ourselves, there's an average of five people involved when we win deals. And then the last one before we can kind of drill into them is, or maybe two. Um, one thing is that we found out that the unidentified phase or the research phase tended to be one or one, 1 1.5 of the identified time. And that's really interesting because that means typically the sales team will tell you, oh, our sales cycle or our customer journey is, you know, from when they entered the CRM system, it took three months and then we won the account. But what actually happened in most cases is that the account actually spent three months just lurking around your website, trying to qualify you against your competition, et cetera. So when you are trying to understand, does my experiments work in marketing? When we're planning our sales budget and so forth, and trying to reverse engineer these numbers that we need to hit, you might be drastically underrating how much time it actually takes to create demand that becomes MQL, SQL, and new biz later on. So that, that's some of the that's that we can, <laughs> we can uh, uh, twist and turn a little bit. I'd love to start with that one that you mentioned most. So when you and I were speaking the other day, it was just a completely kind of reframe of the way that I have for 10 years thought about the sales cycle. And as you rightly said, when most people think about the sales cycle, they literally think about opportunity created to opportunity closed and they measure that time frame. And of course, it makes a lot of sense to do that. But this insight that what happens before the opportunity created is one to 1 1.5 times as long as that sales cycle is eye-opening to me. And you mentioned 31 sessions on your website on average across the deal cycle. That's yeah. a lot of time spent on your website. Imagine what else the buyer is doing, going to review sites, going to competitive sites, going to wherever else they're going. So talk to us about what do you do? How do you as a marketing team, how do you as a sales team optimize your processes with these insights in mind? Yeah, I think the first thing is like, you know, revenue trumps everything else. So it's kind of, if you know your sales team has a certain target in a month or a quarter, you need to be two quarters up in front of them. You know, if we go by the 192 days, which were the mm -hmm. average, if like you can't get more revenue in this year, if that average is true. So it means you really need to pay attention to what is the revenue target and how long does it actually take? So you need to start your activities uh, super early. The other thing is then that you also need to be constantly present on this journey then. So it's not enough that you, you know, pile them into the website once. You need to continuously attract them with, you know, relevant communication. Like, welcome to our website. Okay, this is our product. Do you have a data protection officer that needs this piece of content and so forth? So it's a very long journey and there's so many sessions and you need to have a high quality output of content to like continuously help that process move forward. So I read a stat that jibes pretty nicely with what you're talking about here, Stefan, which is something like in a buying cycle. So once the opportunity is created, the buyer is only spending 11% of their time with the seller. The other 89% of their time is spent doing everything else from building an internal use case, codifying the internal business case, doing the, the research on the review sites that we talked about, exploring competitors, doing reference calls, all those sorts of things. So you mentioned one example of you know, you need to serve up the right content that you think is aligned with the buyer journey so that they're getting what they need contextually when they need it. Anything else that marketing or sales teams can do to try and dissect that actual buying cycle and then meet prospects where they are and provide a valuable experience? Yeah, I think like I'm a big proponent of review websites because I think like in any rational sales process, at least that you will go to the relevant uh, review websites in your industry. So like for both Clary and Dream Data, that's the software review platforms like G2 and Capterra. And it's a way of, I don't know if you're familiar with the sport of curling, but you know, they slide this uh, stone across the ice and like, if you make sure you've wiped the whole ice with brilliant reviews, then you can probably be pretty sure that the sales team is going to have a lot easier job because they can read through. I know, I think Clary has plus a thousand reviews on, on G2 now or something like that. Can I trust that the AE is going to speak the truth when he says it's a good product? Yeah, you probably can. 
in B2B, you need to think about that once you've convinced one person of your software, that person still needs to go back to a company. And if you're selling large, large business or enterprise, he maybe needs to go through five or 10 stakeholders that all needs to go give a thumbs up to this. So you need to think about how do I enable that one champion to go back to all these other people and, you know, do the fight and getting the thumbs up from them. And I think the easy way people can do this is to, at least if their serum hygiene is somewhat okay, and then they can go look at all the one deals and see what are the contacts here? What are the titles that they have? How are, is our website actually covering all these questions that these people might be asking our champion? And we might not get that perfect customer journey where everybody goes and read everything, but we should at least not leave it up to chance that we've produced the quality content that answers the questions that they might have. I love that point, Stefan, because when a lot of, especially salespeople or sales leaders, when they hear the word attribution, they're like, that's just marketing teams trying to take credit for stuff. That's yes. just marketing teams trying to justify their budget. But really, attribution is very different today than what it was even two years ago, certainly five, 10 years ago, because there's so much more data at our disposal. And what a true attribution system can do is it can give you this high fidelity view into the actual deal path. Who are the buyers that were involved? And at what stage were they involved? And then you as a marketing team, as a sales team, as a go-to-market combined team, can go and architect the right journey, the right enablement, the right content, so that you can run that playbook in a way that you know is going to hopefully mirror the success you've had in the past. So that's just my take. I'd love to hear yeah. yours on kind of what attribution is today and, and maybe how it's different from the past or what people may yeah. have preconceived notions about attribution. Yeah, and I think this is kind of uh, one of my pets as well, I, I, so to say, but I think there's a lot of people who don't understand what technology can do for them today. Uh, like five years ago, we didn't have customer data platforms. We didn't have Google Cloud that, and BigQuery that makes running data extremely cheap and all sorts of these things. What I can say what we do today at, at Dream Data, which is our approach to this, that we take it, your organization, and then we take any data silo that touch or interacts with your customers in any way, and then we extract it out of all the silos that it lives within today. That's typically the CRM, it's your calling software, it's your outbound system, it's your CS software, it's your marketing automation, it's your website, it's the real platforms, ad platforms, et cetera. So we want to have everything into the picture. Then we want to model that into an account-based timeline. So we're not going to just stare blindly at a lead because that lead might be of good quality or, or bad quality, but that leads going to have five more colleagues that's going to be part of the, the buying committee. So we have to follow the development of the whole account and not just the one individual. Like in B2B, particularly for marketers, it's so easy to be regarded as a cost because the lead that we attract in marketing is nine out of 10 times, not the ones that are going to sign the contracts afterwards. Right. So you create a cost center that creates a lot of leads and it's completely detached from where the revenue comes in. Mm. But what you can do with a proper B2B attribution uh, platform today is that you can take all these touches that takes place all over the place and get them into one kind of holistic view. And we actually think about it more as a B2B go-to-market data platform where mm. an attribution is a feature, but it's also a way for your salespeople to look at hey, I'm heading into this demo call. I'm not going to fly blind today. So I can actually look at what content was consumed before they reached this phase or how many people do we know at this account? Where's the account? <laughs> what is it about? And, and so forth. So it's, it's much more about aggregating all the data that you sit on. And then you can do analysis like attribution, but you can also look at a ton of other things that are, that is relevant. I love that. And I couldn't possibly agree more. I, I think an interesting trend is a lot of attribution systems in the past, Stefan, were based on what is that one person doing? So we attracted this one person that came to an event and yada, yada, yada. We continued nurturing and they did more things and then they turned into revenue and we were able to track that journey decently well. But as you mentioned, there are multiple people, five, 10, 20 people sometimes involved in a buying decision. And so you mentioned this attribution mindset that's more about an account-based view of attribution. So talk us through the benefits of that and what you would recommend. Yeah, and I think we, instead of like 
you know, attribution can be a somewhat an academic word sometimes. Why I really like the discipline is because, you know, back in the day, I used to play computer games and there sometimes be cheat codes for the game where you yeah. can level up and stuff like that. And to me, knowing how you want an account, that is those cheat codes. Like if you've won a hundred accounts, is there 20 of them who came through from the exact same activity? If you can find those, you want to, you know, double or triple or 10x that one activity that had that impact on your company. And on the flip side of that, you might also have had a bunch of big projects that yielded zero revenue. So it's for me, it's about, I want to understand this path that companies take when they become customers, or at least when they reach the sales pipeline. And then I want to go out and do more of these things. And that's why particularly when we're in B2B companies, they need to think about, you know, what works in an account-based frame. So we're not interested in understanding that one person came from one account because it's going to be five people involved in this deal. We can actually not tie the journey together if we just have that one, unless that you're lucky that it's this one magic unicorn that, you know, does the research, do the demo calls and has the authority to sign the contracts. It's not like that. I think you know that in most cases. So in order to make meaningful decisions of what should we do more of in our go-to-market and what should we do less of, we need to understand these journeys in this account-based world where we have a timeline of it started here and it ended here or it started here and went nowhere so we can scratch these costs as well. It's really well said. And part of doing this well is taking pressure off of the salesperson's shoulders. I think a lot of more traditional sales organizations will require a salesperson to be kind of the broker of information, the broker of knowledge. That is so fundamentally misaligned from everything that we are talking about today, fundamentally misaligned to the buyer journey. Buyers want to be able to do their own research. They want to be able to get their questions answered. And your website should play a major role in that. And yet many companies basically gate valuable information behind a salesperson. They require a conversation in order to give re relatively basic information about the solution. So talk to us about this and maybe some best practices for how to set up your website in conjunction or in parallel with today's buying, how companies buy. Yeah, and I, I think my fundamental view is it's, that it's a very, very stupid, unscalable way to think that we still need to gate things behind AEs because first you need to train the AE to understand all these things. Then you need to hire another AE, which you also need to train. So it, you so often hit a ceiling where it's like you're in trouble if, if that one AE leaves. The way I think about a website is that it should, it should answer any question that you could ask related to a company. At least offer the information there available. So, you know, pricing, how does the product work, who is it for, etc. All the details should be out there. So the salesperson who has to understand the sales craft and you know that's a lot of continuous work following what goes on there doesn't always have to be also a subject matter expert on every single detail of what you have on your website and then as we touched upon a little bit before kyle as well there is this kind of review when you win deals which personas are in there yes and you know is the cfo always part of it then you wouldn't be too far off ex expecting him to like uh, him or her to like a business case. Do you have a business case on your website? Do you deal with sensitive data as we do in, in Dream Data? Do you have a SOC 2 certification or do you have a security page, et cetera? So it's, you can do a quite rational exercise here of thinking through how does the website look? Are we covering any questions that you could be asking? Because that's going to make it we run a predominantly inbound model at Dream Data. So our AEs, they know that this information is available on the website. And typically the calls that they take part of are quite qualified because they've come in and they've been able to consume this information before booking that demo call. So hopefully you'll see that if you do this in your business as well, is that the conversion rate should be higher on demo calls because all the information has already been available for the customer. And as you said, you know, is it 11% nine, nine, not these days that had, takes place outside of your entities? Right. That's a lot. So you have to think about is that you need to be an enabler instead of being a, somebody who stops this. 
it's really well said. The website as an enabler for buyers is, is critical. And I, and I love this kind of joining a couple different thoughts you've had today, Stefan. If your marketers are listening to sales calls, if your marketers are embedded in sales meetings, they're going to hear the questions that prospects or customers are asking about your product. And that should then basically allow you to do an audit gap of what do we have on our website and what don't we? What content should we create? How should we change the structural navigation of the website? Maybe it makes sense to have uh, in the main navigation, a drop down for personas for all the key personas that are coming up in 80% of our deals. And, and here are the questions we need to answer for each of them. So you can go down again, this very logical exercise that yes, requires some elbow grease. It's going to require some work. It's going to take a little time, but the goal here is to grease the wheels for the sales team to make life easier for sales. If you're not selling, you're not marketing, you're wasting money basically. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so that's the mindset you have to have. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> Couldn't agree more, Kyle. Any closing thoughts, Stefan, I'll say one more time that you've got a handful of all of these best practices that you've outlined are all on your site. We will link to these things in the show notes so that people can see how to drive alignment between sales and marketing. They can see the beautiful uh, write-up you have on all the benchmarks for the customer journey. The last question I got for you is a bonus question I ask everybody. I'm curious for you to recommend a book to us. You made this transition from sales to marketing. How can marketers develop more empathy for salespeople? Is there a particular book you've read that was a real light bulb moment for you? I haven't read a book that was this. I think it's the, the kind of pain of doing demo calls with unqualified leads that <laughs> was the uh, game changer for me because you just think I'm wasting one hour here and I'm getting nowhere. So the next demo call that I'm going to book is going to be of a lot more quality than the one I just had. But I think, you know, Kyle, it's also about like you need to, as a B2B marketer, you need to deal with this proactively. So if the sales team is not showing up at your doorstep, telling them what they need, you need to walk into the room physically or digital and ask them, what is a good account? Who do you like to sell to? What can we do more of? What's your problems? How can we fix it? And vice versa. If the sales team doesn't think that the marketing team is doing a good job, get in there take responsibility, be proactive about making sure that these things align. So, you know, you help each other instead of like being in each of your own uh, camp and just doing your own thing. 100%. The marketing team is responsible for helping identify and stop all of this revenue leak that's happening across the lead life cycle, across the opportunity life cycle and everywhere in between. It takes a full revenue team effort. And that's why we, we talk about not sales or marketing, it's sales and marketing, it's go to market, it's one single revenue team. Amazing stuff today, Stefan, I can't thank you enough. Again, Stefan is the CMO at Dream Data. Check him out, dreamdata.io. This is it. Thank you so much for the time, Stefan. You were amazing. Thank you, Kyle. I really enjoyed it. All right, y'all. That's a wrap on this episode of the Run Revenue Podcast. We will catch you next week. Don't forget to check out in the show notes, the wonderful collateral assets from the Dream Data team, and we'll see you soon. Don't let what you heard today go to waste. Take two minutes to download today's checklist to get your priorities in line for the week. You can find that linked in our show notes. And if you liked what you heard, make sure you give us a five-star rating and leave a review. We'll be back next Monday with more to help you win your week.